Um, so I, I wander a bit, and I was a little bit worried. So I asked our um, people back here in IT to help me out and put, give me a lavalier, because I have a feeling I'd be coming over here, and you guys wouldn't be hearing me. So if anyone doesn't hear me, I'm wandering too much, and I'm not speaking into my mic, please holler out. Um, Personally, I like lectures to be interactive. I know it's getting late in the day and we're day two, so death by PowerPoint's not gonna help anybody out. So any concepts that I'm not getting across, um, again, I, I don't mind if, uh, if you guys want me to clarify anything, so please shout out. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, uh, I think one of the reasons why I was invited to lecture today is I direct, and that should be one of my disclosures, I direct the child abuse consult service through the banner system. Um, we primarily do our consults at Cardin Children's, um, Thunderbird, and Diamond Children's down in Tucson. I'm in Tucson, and I have partners in our scan consult service that uh, are housed here in, in, in Phoenix. Um, and uh, we will do consults for those services, and I direct that. Um, uh, it takes about 50% of my duties. My other half of me is uh, in the emergency department. I primarily work pediatric emergency department. Although, as mentioned, I'm a certified to see adults too, so I do about 20% of my time in the uh, adult emergency department down in Tucson, Banner University, Tucson. So, and I was very uh, happy and thankful to be uh, invited to be able to lecture to you guys. Um, my objectives, I want to talk about strategies on how to identify non-accidental trauma, and the acronym I'll keep using is NAT. Um, common features that help us identify that, um, what kind of strategies we can use in the emergency department, and then I'm going to touch a little bit on some of the regulatory obligations that we have, uh, primarily focusing on Arizona, but also as far as our federal, federal mandatory reporting statutes. Um, obviously, Child abuse is an emotional um, problem. It's got significant morbidity and mortality. It's a very burdensome on society, and we could talk a lot of statistics in regard to that, and I have some of those listed here, but it's pretty dramatic. Um, a couple years ago, they did an ad campaign to try to illustrate to the country, it was a national ad campaign, that children don't tell us that they're being abused. It's not obvious all the time. So if we're seeing certain identifiers that we should be able to report because you know, every state kind of lists who's a mandatory reporter, but the reality of it is, is we all kind of have a role in that um, as far as reporting what our concerns might be. Um, and unfortunately, they're not always, always reported. We're not always identifying, investigating. We're not always rescuing these patients. In the medical community, that's paramount. We have to identify them because we can't help them if we don't identify. Uh, we're obviously going to facilitate a thorough evaluation. We're going to treat them. We're going to protect them. Um, and extrapolating that concept, whenever we care for someone in the clinical environment, trauma versus emergency department environment, we need to some degree consider how safe they're going to be when, they're good, when they go home. And we can parallel that with a number of disease processes. The elderly patient who has a head injury is on Coumadin, we don't want them to be a fall risk at home. Do they have help? Um, are they being dizzy? Are they at risk of another fall? Same thing with children. And it's pretty dramatic when you look at some of the outcome, um, uh, outcome and the, the morbidity and mortality that can be associated with child abuse. 15 to 30% of these patients have a chance of dying if we don't identify them early. And again, we're going to talk a lot about early identification of these patients, but up to three quarters of them will be abused again. So physical injury, medical concerns, but also long-term social concerns, right? I mean, the adverse life events that someone can have after being in that environment is pretty dramatic. Um, and that's ultimately the trick is how can, we, how can we identify these patients? How can we stop the abuse? So I love to pick on my own uh, profession. And this was a study that was um, conducted retrospectively of children who died. And they went, went backwards and they looked to see when they had medical care uh, previously. And they reviewed 44 cases. One out of five, roughly, 19% of them were actually seen a month before they had died. Okay, so they were in the clinical environment. Almost three quarters of those happened in the emergency department. The emergency department, I talk about the emergency department because that's my job, but that parallels trauma services, right? 
that is a major catchment area for children who are having afflicted injuries. Okay? So if we're going to identify them retrospectively, we look to see, well, okay, why did they go to medical care? And unfortunately, a fair amount of that was pretty vague symptoms, fussiness, vomiting, poor feeding, um, the bruising. Bruising's apparent. So maybe that's something that we could focus in on, on how to identify these patients, and I'll be talking more about that. So another study. Um, again, retrospective, larger population. A third of them, of children diagnosed with being abused, had at least one visit to the emergency department before being diagnosed. Almost one out of 10, 7%, had three visits to the emergency department before being diagnosed as an abuse, a victim of abuse. So pretty remarkable. We're seeing these kids, um, for sure. Um, so why are we missing them? Well, we talked about the fact that fussiness is a pretty vague finding, right? Bruising, that can be apparent. Um, some of it, I think, was really uh, uh, delved in, at least in this study. It's, it's a little bit of a dated study, but what it did was it illustrated a very good point as to what some of the difficulties might be. And what they did was they retrospectively looked at children who fell and the clinical outcome, did they die from their injuries? In the height of the fall. So children who fell from 10 feet to 45 feet, 177 patients reviewed retrospectively, only one death. And that was actually the child that fell 45 feet. The, the kids who fell from heights of four to 10 feet, no deaths in the study group, okay? 65 patients, not a one dead. Then you look at the patients who fell from heights less than four feet. 100 patients, seven of them died. 7% morbidity when you fall less than four feet. Does it make sense? No. In fact, the author went on to make some assumptions, but prospectively had identified that five of those seven patients were actually investigated for inflicted injury. We're not getting the right story. It was, a, it, was a very, it was a landmark paper because it illustrated that we can't always rely on the reported mechanism. Um, and if that mechanism doesn't fit the severity of injury, obviously that should be one of our red flags. Okay. So you can pull up any medical textbook and you can look at what are the, what are the risk factors, dysfunctional families, disabilities. The younger you are, the more likely you are to have inflicted injury. Is there drugs in the home or the challenging child? Um, all of those are kind of predictors, and those are somewhat intuitive. Um, the reality, and this came off the internet, the reality is anybody could be the abuser. And that's where we need to have a broad perspective to be able to review these cases and have a broad degree of concern to be able to identify them. So, not Ronald McDonald, though. Um, so what we really advocate for our services and when we consult is a broad perspective and a broad view. We need to take a lot of considerations in mind when it comes to de developing a degree of concern of whether or not a child's being abused, okay? The presentation, okay, does, this, does the injury fit the mechanism? Um, are there social risk factors that we're identifying? What are our caregiver suspicions? Um, very much a team approach. The nurse managing the patient is gonna see different things than I'm gonna see because I'm in the room at different times and frankly, the nurse is in the room more than I am. Um, and what are we finding as far as diagnostic findings? Key injuries that have a high degree of concern. We mentioned bruises, but fractures can be associated too, okay? But whenever it comes to subtle disease processes in medicine, we develop a screening tool and a way of developing a scoring system even to be more accurate to be able to identify these patients. Okay, and there's a dog there. Okay, I'm not getting a lot of laughs. This is a post-lunch thing, right? <laughs> okay, all right. Um, this is one that I really espouse. Um, and uh, for full disclosure, we are trying to have this embedded into our medical record, um, electronic medical record system. But it's the escape screening tool. It's a set of six questions that I'm gonna introduce you guys to. And this is a nursing driven on intake in triage tool that was vetted, tested, and does not um, impact patient flow. Um, and it's very quick and easy to perform and it has been prospectively validated, okay? And I have no financial um, you know, ties or anything like that. I just like the t a screening tool. 
Um, and here's your six questions. Is the history consistent? Meaning, are they, are they modifying the injury mechanism? Okay. Was seeking medical help delayed? Does the onset of injury fit with the developmental level of the child? Child comes in with a head injury. He's a month old. He or she's a month old. And he said he rolled off the changing table. Well, does a one-month-old roll? Does it fit with the developmental level of the child? Um, are findings on your exam consistent with the history? Um, are there other signals that make you doubt the safety of the child? Any one positive in those screens positive and should develop essentially a stepwise process to further evaluation. And that's the whole idea of the screening. Any one positive requires more scrutiny. Okay? And how that is applied you can obviously vary. But when they studied it prospectively at these centers, so the seven emergency departments in the Netherlands, okay, and there's your reference down there. Um, they imp implemented it and applied the screening tool to about 100,000 patients, and they had 520 patients that were screened positive. So that detection rate of 0.5% ultimately went to an expert panel where the expert panel ref was used as the gold standard to confirm or refute the, the result of the screen. And they showed that the screening would um, essentially demonstrated 0.5% positives versus 0.1% not screened because they paralleled it with a non-screened patient population, so they did cohort the study, um, and the odds detection rate was increased up uh, fivefold as a result of applying the screening tool. Okay. Now the kicker is, is that sometimes we overshoot, but with any significant disease process that you don't want to miss, you want a high degree of sensitivity, so you overshoot and you wind up having false positives. And here they had about a 20% 20, 20 false positive rate, okay? Which is kind of, kind of the catch-22 when it comes to in, uh, investigating or pursuing concerns of child abuse is sometimes we do look into those cases that aren't ultimately true, um, but we don't want to miss anybody, so we want that high degree of sensitivity, okay? And again, those are the questions that we had. Nursing delivered in triage through the study, prospectively validated um, or on intake, um, again, did not, pay, did not slow down patient care flow rates. So um, something that uh, we're trying to work on. So giving you some case examples. This is a child that we saw in the emergency department, had a laceration of the forehead. Parents brought him in, said he fell while he was running. Makes sense. We see this all the time. I'm not going to call DCS. I'm not going to call law enforcement. Parents are appropriate. Parents are appropriately concerned. There was no delay to care, et cetera. Okay? I kid you not, this kiddo came in with the exact same complaint. He fell while running. Okay? Um, evaluated the child. Obviously, injury didn't fit mechanism. Imaging showed that there was a frontal skull fracture. No intracranial bleeding, fortunately. Um, asked the mother again. I'm a little concerned that something else might have happened because I can't see run unless he's running 30 miles an hour um, doing this kind of an injury. Well, he fell out of a tree. So the story kept adjusting. Eventually, she admitted to using a baseball bat. So, um, but the story kept adjusting. Okay? And again, that's one of your screening elements, a, ch a changing history. Okay? Whoops. Uh, these are two other kiddos that were referred to our advocacy center, which is our outpatient processing center, and they both had subconjunctival hemorrhages um, in both kiddos. Um, interviewed this kiddo, and he said, yeah, I've been coughing for the last two weeks. Well, we know that a subconjunctival hemorrhage can happen with heavy Valsalva events. Coughing really hard, vomiting really hard, something like that. Whereas this kiddo had hemorrhages in all quadrants, he has a little ecchymosis under his eyes, and when you further your exam, you actually see some linear marks on his neck. Okay, what happened to this child? Yeah, yes, likely strangulation. And in fact, he was forensically interviewed and did disclose that stepdad had choked him. Okay, but again, injury just did not fit mechanism. It's that trigger that allows us to look into it a little bit more, where we ultimately forensically interview. We call DCS. We call law enforcement. We identify the true injury mechanism, giving examples, okay? Now this, again, a dated study, but it was a landmark study because I think it illustrated a very good point. I love the way they did the study. I wish I had thought about it. 
I wasn't practicing back then, but I was a medical student. Um, but all they did was they had about 1,000 children who came into the clinic, disrobed them, and looked them over head to toe to see if they had any bruises. Okay? And they broke it down to age groups. And it, children under six months of age, 0.6 or maybe 1 in 200, had any bruise at all. Okay? And again, these are children who are coming to the clinic for well-child visits. So it was just surveying those, those uh, patients based on age. As they got older, over, um, nine months and younger, one in 50, roughly, had a bruise. Okay? But in these groups, there was trunk bruises were extremely rare, okay? without, a, without a reported mechanism, and no bruises to the hands or buttocks. Okay? Once they got older and they were starting to do things and they started to cruise and they started to walk, you saw a much higher prevalence of bruises. Because what was a child doing when they're crawling? They're crawling long hand slips. They may have a bump their forehead and get a bruise. So typical bruising pattern based upon their developmental age. But what does a six-month-old do? Okay, Six-month-old, they're, they're barely sitting up at that point, right? So how are they going to develop enough accelerative force to be able to bruise themselves? Okay, The reality is, is the younger you are, the more likely that it was an inflicted injury. The question was, is was it nefarious? Okay, and a parent, you know, I mean, I have two children that are now in their 20s, but I remember those days of daily taking care of a child bathing. You knew what happened to them. And when we have a child who has an injury and the parent says, I don't know, that should tr strike some red flags because we tend to know all the features of our child because we're so doting and we care for them. So, and again, this coined a term of if they don't cruise, rarely bruise, but what it illustrated is there's injury patterns based upon the gross motor development of a child that are predictable in nature. Doesn't mean that you can't have the exception. I mean, crazy things happen, and it's not illegal to be stupid, we say very often in the emergency department. Um, not to be negative on our patient population sometimes, but, um, but we need to scrutinize it. So here's an example for you, so a femur fracture. Under a year of age versus over a year of age. Under a year, femur fractures have an 80% association with being inflicted, okay? If they are over a year, only about a third are associated with being inflicted. Why? Parents in the room, what happens when you're one? You start walking, right? Because you're actually doing motor activity that puts yourself in a predicament to have an accidental injury. Okay, crazy things can happen. But you're ambulating at that point. So it depends on, uh, how about the forearm buckle fractures? Nine months of age, they're scooting, right? They're holding on to something and they're walking along. They slip, they fall onto an outstretched hand, okay? So again, injury patterns reflect the gross motor function of a child. Acquired, could it be acquired through regular play activities? These are the mechanisms that we try to scrutinize. And this I just pulled off the internet, cut and pasted it. You can find plenty of examples. I don't want you all to turn into developmental pediatricians by no means. But you can get all this stuff off the internet. There's tools at what gross motor function you can have at certain ages. Laminate it, put it in your, put in your book that you have that you carry around when you're at work so you can refer to it. Or just jump on the internet. The sources are out there. Okay. Sentinel injuries. Okay. Sentinel events are events that predict a larger event, essentially. Okay. So this study was conducted in 2013, and what they did was they retrospectively looked at a whole lot of children who were admitted to the hospital. And they stratified the groups as, as to those that were, had a definite concern for being abused, a possible concern which were in the immediate group, or ones in which they didn't have a concern at all. And then they went through their past medical history to try to define were they seen by a doctor before. And if they were, what were those injuries that they may have sustained? And they, they essentially identified that the definites, the most likely children, children most likely to be abused, roughly one in four of them had a sentinel injury. Okay, if they were possible, one in 10. But the ones had no concern, none of them had a sentinel injury. And how do we define a sentinel injury? Sentinel injuries were atypical injuries. Bruises, intraoral injuries, injuries to the trunk, those were sentinel in nature. 
So a child who's seen previously for bruises can sometimes be that hallmark that predicts injury. Okay. Here's a case that I had in the emergency department on the pediatric emergency side of our, of our emergency department. Child five months of age came in for increased work of breathing. It was January, it was RSV season. Half my patients, actually probably three quarters of my patients had some sort of a cold, increased work of breathing. This kiddo was just like all the others. Um, mom even reported a runny nose, a low grade fever and some coughing. So we move on to examine this child and his work of breathing wasn't that bad. He did not look clinically that bad. But here's a picture of him. What are you seeing? Okay. He's got some lesions here. Okay. Picture's a little granular, but I'll tell you those are bruises. Okay. How did he get those? Ooh, goodness, I see a bruise. How did he get those? Mom's like, I don't know. Five month old. Well, do you care for your child all the time? Yeah, go to, go to daycare, uh, babysitter? No, no, I take care of them all the time. How did those happen? I don't know. Red flags, right? They're going off. So here's another picture of him. So facial bruises. So we pulled the trigger and started essentially abuse workup. We didn't call police right away, but we started our imaging, okay? Skeletal survey. Here's a chest radiograph, okay? Um, for those who are less familiar with radiographs, these bulbar nature, the bulbous portions to the ribs, those are calluses. Those are healed fracture, healing fractures. Show me a rib on this kid that's not broken. No wonder why he was having a hard time breathing. Skeletal survey also showed a small linear occipital fracture, um, a tibial fracture, long bone fracture that was healing in nature. Um, CT showed no intracranial bleeding, um, but definitely a concern for inflicted injury that we called DCS and law enforcement for. I would have sent this kid home. I, if I didn't see the bruises, I would have sent this child home. You know, saline suctioning, you know, humidifier in the room, he'll get over his cold. And that's the scary part. That's how this can be, get so scary. Okay. Um, yes, ma'am. Yes. Um, so, um, uh, I'm sorry, the last part? So, a brittle bone, we call it a brittle, you know, brittle bone workup. So um, radiographs, you know, there's plenty of literature that'll, that'll tell you that if you don't see typical osteopenic and or um, anatomical suggestion of it, that the likelihood of easy fractures is, is near zero. And that's the abuse literature. But that being said, when we see multiple fractures, we do get a parathyroid. We get a vitamin D level on these children. So that's a very good question. And, those, on this kiddo, yes. Yeah, and I'll have a slide a little bit more when I go into an algorithm, but those are routine. So when we work up a child who's had multiple fractures, is there a reason for them to fracture easily? And that was done. Right, right. It, yeah, even though someone may have underlying uh, mineralization and or skeletal disease, doesn't mean the injuries weren't inflicted in nature. They still need to be investigated. Yeah, you're 100% right. So, okay. So, so let's start talking about some of our processing. So what do the trauma centers in Arizona need to do when it comes to screening for abuse and, and or be prepared to take care of children who might be abused? So Arizona Trauma Center standards were updated in the Arizona Administrative Code. And in January of 2018, they added the line, child maltreatment assessment capability required for all trauma levels, one through four, okay? So the question ultimately came up was, okay, what does that mean? So Bureau of EMS and Trauma, State Trauma Advisory Board essentially started putting together kind of a guideline for the trauma centers, and I was fortunate enough to be able to help on that. Um, and that is essentially listed here. And again, this is a requirement for all trauma centers in Arizona. So one, implement written policies and procedures, protocol for screening children. Two, document of annual staff training and recognition. 
um, and prompt reporting, and three, develop and implement a continuous quality improvement process. And they, they subset that um, quality improvement to review if they, um, they identified cases of suspected maltreatment, that they were recognized, that they reported them, and that there was actions um, that were reviewed retrospectively for compliance. Okay, so this is now listed as a trauma requirement for all levels, okay? And then hot off the press, I had to update my slides to include this. This came out just last week, ACS trauma quality programs. And I read through this for the pediatric part. That being said, it's child abuse, elder abuse, and intimate partner violence, and I think it's very good. I think, I, yeah, of course it's good. The ACS put it out and recognized by a variety of groups. Um, here's your index, and if you don't have this, please email me. I have my email on the final slide, um, and I can send it to you. But it's a very good outline. Here's a, a cut of the table of contents. It talks about assessing, uh, screening, getting your history, what are you know, bruising versus oral findings. We we're talking about sentinel injuries. What skeletal, in, uh, skeletal evaluation, what hit injury findings we can see, how to image, what labs to get. So it's pretty comprehensive, it's good. Um, they also have some tables on some of the screening tools that you can use, and I'm just showing you excerpts of these. Again, just came out last week, PDF, download it. Um, um, and yeah, the screening tool that I would like to endorse is one that actually looks for bruises. This is the 10-4 faces screening algorithm. Again, a lot of patients, retrospective study. They just looked them over head to toe to see where the bruises were on these kiddos. And the way the acronym works is um, children under four years of age that have bruises to the torso, ears, or neck, or faces, and the faces included frenulum, angle of the jaw, cheek, eyelid, subconjunctiva, or patterned injury under four years of age was significantly concerning for abuse with a sensitivity and specificity of 96 and 87 percent. Children four months of age or younger with any bruise anywhere also fit criteria 96 percent sensitivity, 87 percent specificity. If you simply apply, and this has been prospectively validated, if you simply apply this screening tool, you're gonna catch 96% of your child abuse cases. Pretty darn good, right? Here's the kicker, and it's just the same with that other, previous slide on that uh, other tool that I had mentioned. Since it, specificity is not as high, 87%. So 13%, one in six, is gonna be a false positive, so we're gonna investigate one in six falsely, okay? And that's the exchange. But if a child has up to a 15% of dying when they go home, three quarters chance of further abuse when they go home, I'm gonna overshoot. And that's the selling point that I'd take to you all. I'm gonna overshoot and I'm gonna apply this screening tool. 10 four faces, okay? Any bruises under four months of age or younger, so under five months, I guess. Any bruise at all. For years or younger, 10 TEN faces. Um, 10, 10 four faces is in the ACS release that I showed you earlier, okay? And the uh, ACS release also has some appendixes that I think are really helpful, gap assessment tool, but also the Mary Bridge Children's Hospital screening tool, um, which I think is very good. Uh, ACS got permission to publish this, um, but I think it's being freely released. In fact, a year ago, when we were getting prepared for the Cardin site visit, we actually asked permission to be able to uh, use this and created our own for our banner trauma system. And I'll show you that. But that's the Mary Bridge in Washington. This is essentially their algorithm they use in the emergency department. Okay. Now this is ours and you can see banners up here. And I don't endorse one over the other because they're pretty similar. Um, the phone numbers, you know, who to call, Ghostbusters. I heard a speaker say that earlier today. Um, uh, so this is adapted to our hospital. So I would highly encourage you <clears throat> to develop an algorithm for your facility um, because it gets, gives you that stepwise approach to, uh, to uh, evaluate these children and to analyze them. So and, uh, 
And I didn't expect you guys to read all of that, but I have some blow-ups here. So, um, what, so it starts out with what are our red flags? No history, changing history, unwitnessed injury, injuries to the frenulum. You've heard these, right? There's 10-4, okay? Um, and then histories that are concerning in the yellow, okay? Delay to care, domestic violence in the home, okay? Failure to thrive, relatively concerning. Okay? If they hit any of the red flags, we want to be consulted. And that's how we're working through our hospital system. We want to be consulted um, as far as that uh, is concerned. Um, laboratory studies. Now, a lot of this dovetails with what we're going to already do for our trauma patients. right? Standard labs, CBC, coagulation studies, belly labs. But if there's multiple fractures, we're going to want to get a parathyroid, a vitamin D, et cetera. Imaging, I mentioned skeletal surveys, okay? Pretty common, in fact, it's kind of our basis to our imaging pattern for children. We do a skeletal survey, and then ultimately when to obtain a head CT. Some, some facilities will CT every child concerned for abuse under a year. Other facilities, it's under six months, um, or clinically, uh, clinically required, okay? Here's your skeletal survey. If you guys aren't familiar with those, it's 20 radiographs. So the American College of Radiology and the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends for degree of sensitivity 20 standard views, and they're all listed here, okay? And the recommendations that they put out is if you're concerned for abuse under two years of age, it's necessary to do a skeletal survey, okay? Remember my child who was breathing, funny. We did a skeletal survey, and it triggered the rest of our workup. Two to five years of age, it's recommended. Over five years of age, the imaging is clinically directed. Okay? Again, AAP, American College of Radiology recommendations as far as skeletal surveys are concerned. All right? Now, that being said, when you have a trauma patient and you're discharging them, and they had a skeletal survey, we also recommend a follow-up skeletal survey. And studies have shown 20% of these patients will have additional findings when you do follow-up skeletal survey. Um, so we do follow-up skeletal survey when they're seen at the advocacy center follow-up clinic. Okay. As far as consults are concerned, you've got to work on in the infrastructure of your hospital. Caseworkers, social workers, invaluable. Okay. They're going to help us when it comes to talking with DCS and or law enforcement. Okay. Obviously, we have a consult service that we can use at my hospital um, that we would help the trauma service with in managing these patients. Reporting to DCS. I, I fully um, endorse a huddle approach in that regard. It's the entire team that's making this decision. It's not the physician alone. It's not the nurse, nurse alone. It's not the social worker alone. You need to work collectively to gather all of your information and then ultimately make your report. It's a very much a huddle in the reporting process, the disposition process, and even the discharge process. Um, here's your mandatory reporting statute. Um, and this is for all patients. We have to report material injury by law. And if you do not, it's a class three misdemeanor. So some people ask me, well, what, hap what happens if it's class three misdemeanor? Um, the most severe, and I've never heard this happen, um, but the most severe in a class three misdemeanor is um, uh, up, to, uh, up to six months in, in jail, $500 fine, and a year on probation. <laughs> Again, I've never heard this happen to anyone. But that being said, any material injury that could be nefarious in nature, okay? So material injury result from fight, brawl, robbery, or other illegal or unlawful act. That's pretty broad. So if you think something happened and there's a material injury, you have to report it. You have to document it and report it. Here's your mandatory reporting law for child abuse, okay? Duty to report abuse, physical injury, neglect, denial, or deprivation. Um, and any person who reasonably believes that a minor has been the victim of physical injury, abuse, child abuse, a reportable offense, or neglect, shall immediately report. Okay? Or cause, or cause to be report. So when I lecture to EMS, paramedics, I tell them, you are mandatory reporters. Now, if you're 100% confident that I'm going to report for you, you don't have to report. Because you're causing it to be report. But if you're not sure it's going to be reported, you are a mandatory reporter. And that's, again, Arizona statute. Um, 
do I have someone who's going to wave me at time? Because I think I'm going over, um, just in case. Um, I tend to belabor my slides. <laughs> Documenting injury. I'm pretty close to being done, though. So bite-like, finger-like. Um, try to avoid terms like that that imply mechanism. You want to be as descriptive as possible, and you want to describe and document. In fact, a body diagram, I think, is amazing. So, uh, many of the EMR systems will allow you to do this electronically. Um, body di diagram is incredible. In your assessment section, you can extrapolate. You can give opinion. But at my shop, I tell the trauma docs, I say, let me do it for you. I mean, heck, maybe it keeps you out of court. I mean, you can still be called as a fact witness, but we work pretty integrally with law enforcement and the investigator and agencies when it comes to that as a surrogate for the work that the trauma service does. Uh, and that's the beauty of having a child abuse service is it protects your house staff, to be honest with you. But document and diagram as much as you can because these go to court two years later, three years later, and you forget it. Um, the more you document, the better you are. Photograph documentation, incredibly helpful. Okay, this is a child who was horribly injured and in the ICU in relation to abuse. Those are skin findings. Child died. This is 12 hours after death. They're not there anymore. Now, if the, if the medical examiner has the insight to be able to biopsy and do some histological sections on this, they could probably identify some hemosiderin, you know, macrophaged, engorged hemosiderin or anything like that. But if you don't see it, it's hard to say. And that photo documentation is invaluable in that regard. Um, so I think photo documentation is what I highly endorse. Yeah, this child died from internal injury, uh, head injury, abdominal injury. Yeah, so this is, uh, again, oop. The one on the right, 12 hours post-mortem. This child died. Okay. As far as evidence collection is concerned, you have to maintain chain of custody. I'm not going to belabor this because we are not the investigators. We are not the investigators. We're not the accusers. When it comes to parental involvement, I mean, we want to be their best friends. Okay. But that being said, medical care trumps everything. Excuse the euphemism. Um, it, it, um, it, 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 it is prioritized. So for a sexual assault patient who needs a Foley, the last thing you want to do is put a bunch of betadine there and lose all your biological information. So we're cautious in that regard. But all chain of custody refers to is that the evidence collection and the documentation of that collection was identified throughout. So our county attorneys in Tucson, I can collect it, and then I'll eventually hand it over to, a, to an officer as a field kit, okay? But I may be called in front of the court to sign an affidavit that says, I had that at all times until I gave it to the officer. And that's all it means, is that you know what happened to it, you know what was done with it, you know where it came from, and no one, no one essentially messed or contaminated it. Um, and that's simply an affidavit or a collection kit. It's as simple as that. If no one's ever done a sexual assault collection kit, it is silly simple. It's just a lot of writing, okay? But that being said, if I have a child who has injury, I'm gonna to try to preserve evidence. If you're worried about the, you know, a sexual assault and someone scratches, there could be DNA under the fingernails. I'm gonna put gloves on that patient, okay? Decontaminating the genital area when I'm placing a Foley, try to avoid that. Um, if I need to do a swab, I'll do a swab, and the, the, the little Q-tip swabs is the identical kind of swab that's in the forensic collection kit. I'll do a swab, and I'll put in a biohazard kit, and I'll stick it in my pocket. Law enforcement shows up, who's got essentially a filled collection kit, and I sign it over. It's really as easy as that, and you just have to arrange with your local law enforcement agency and your local county attorney's unit. Um, it really is that easy. Um, when it comes to discharging and communication with the family, my suggestion, be their best friend. We are not the investigators. We are not a judge and jury. I have found over the years that it's the parent that brings the child in who's actually the one that's concerned about them. Okay? It's someone else that's abusing the child. So it does me no good to accuse and, um, to accuse and get confrontational with the guardian that's present with me. What's, um, what's the, that euphemism, you can catch more flies with honey than vinegar? <laughs> 
Um, I want them to be as open as possible. I want them to disclose as much as possible. So I don't confront, I'm gonna be their best friend. But I'm gonna keep asking them what happened. I'm concerned this injury doesn't match what you're telling me it happened. Can you think of anything else? Okay, and I think that's the best approach. Um, uh, but bottom line is we cannot remove guardian's rights. We cannot do that. So we still need that guardian to consent for permission to care for the child. Now we do have statute clause for emergency care, um, but the only person that can remove parental right is DCS, who essentially removes guardianship with what they call a temporary custody notice, or law enforcement, who's got the authority to do that. So um, I work as much as I can with the family members and it's really hard to separate those emotions because sometimes these abuse cases can be so egregious and they can be uh, very trying emotionally. Um, and that extends to debriefing as a trauma group, an emergency department group, debriefing after the case to be able to talk through this and social supports through your friends, family, and even the institution that you work at because these are very emotionally trying at times. Um, and I think that wraps me up and I apologize if I went over. And there's my email. Um, if anyone needs any of these documents, and the documents that I referenced are all listed here. Um, and if anyone wants my slide sets, email me. I'll be happy to share them. Uh, I'll, I'll switch back. I think you're taking pictures. Okay. Yep. There's my email. Okay. Thank you.